it was a conscious decision that uh, we took as a program committee to try and ensure some continuity between sessions. We wanted to have a theme that ran throughout, or if not a theme, then a logical flow at least. Uh, you know, starting from why does one do design? How does one do design? Uh, how does one make a living doing something that you love or building something that you love? And I think that Ben's talk really got there, you know. It's not something that one thinks of traditionally as design, because design is often perceived to be what something looks like. But that's only a very veneer, that's, the, uh, uh, that's a very superficial veneer, I, in my opinion. Design is a complete process, right, from how do you start creating an environment for yourself to actually build amazing products or to build amazing things and then go into the details of how one actually does it, starting from what goes into it, why does something have to go into it, which in fact is what Navjot is going to talk about. He's going to talk about not the intricacies of technologies that you use, what kind of programs you edit your images in, not going to talk about you know, new techniques or new visual identities, but he's going to talk about why a question which is uh, essential when you're building something. Why does X go into it? Why does my product do this? Why does my product exist in the first place? And I think that's an extremely important question. So Navjot uh, was a brief internet celebrity because of a t-shirt. <laughs> and since then, of course, his life has been meaningless. He's an <laughs> Uh, he used to wear it. He used to work for Opera, and he had this T-shirt which said, "Show me Opera on your phone, and I'll buy you a beer." Right? So he ended up buying a lot of people beers, and it was possibly the best marketing campaign that Opera ever ran. So, um, he's now um, he's not a trained designer. Uh, he's not a trained graphic designer, but works as an interaction designer, building mobile products in Singapore. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually interesting. There's two buttons here. One says power on off, and the other button says on mute. <laughs> I was like, is that supposed to be like mute on, or how does that work? Uh, so yeah, thanks for Ahul for the uh, for the introduction, and uh, and thanks Ben for setting up the stage for for this conference. You know. Um, um, so uh, my first slide, uh, it's it's wireframes. Um, like Rahul mentioned, I'm not a trained designer. Um, I always wanted to, I was always fascinated by design and I always knew I, needed, I wanted to create products and or create things. Uh, but I, I really didn't know how. So, you know, so like most people here, I just started doing things and kind of stumbled into things. And then eventually, right now, I'm, I'm doing design full time, um, which uh, so far has been great. Um, so this is actually going back to uh, when I was still in uni. I used to see these kind of pictures come up you know, online. And, and this, was, this was amazing for me, because I would look at these pictures, and I'd be so fascinated by them. They would inspire me. You know? I'd look at these wireframes, and they're so neat and clean. And I'd be like, wow. Um, you know, just samples of pictures, and you know, people looking cool drawing wireframes as well. So. Um, so I was like, you know, I look at these pictures all day, and, and the thought that would come to my mind would be, I want to draw wireframes. I want to make wireframes. And, uh, you know, people go into so much detail with their wireframes, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, it is inspiring. It's also very, um, it's, it's, it's something that I think, you know, I'm not alone, but a lot of designers really love. You know, we'll go online. There's blogs about it, right? There's blogs about just wireframes and good-looking wireframes. You go to dribble people uploading wireframes. Um, so I went back and I said, you know, I would go back and I would like, I want to draw wireframes. So I would, I would, I started drawing wireframes and, and I, you know, these are some of my own and I tried to make them look good and make them take pictures with Instagram where they looked even better or looked good when they didn't. So, you know, just really, really try to, um, just, you know, and, and I, this is, this is one of my wireframes. Um, 
where you know it's actually looking like an app, I would just be like, ah, oh, I'm going to make this, take a picture and upload it. It's going to be the awesome, the best thing ever, right? It's going to go on my blog. And um, what I became is a self, in, you know, it's confessed wireframe hoe. That's what I like to call myself. Um, <laughs> where I was just, just so obsessed with wireframes. I was like, you know, and these things really, really inspire me. And everyone who's in design, you know, looks at them. What I realized over time, though, is um, wireframes, you know, as I, as I, I started off, actually, uh, Ben had, a, had an interesting anecdote where, you know, he, he was sitting over here as an eight-year-old, and he was saying, um, I was drawing this man bouncing around in Flash. That's where I started as well, Ben. Uh, I, when I started, I was actually, I moved to Bangalore in 2003 for my six, I had a, period of six months where I could do an internship. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to Bangalore. I, I grew up in Chandigarh in the north. So I was like, okay, I'm going to move to Bangalore because I can meet some interesting people there. And actually, one of the people who really inspired me at that time was in the audience as well, Brajeshwar, sitting back over there. Uh, he had this website, you know, and, and he, he, he was doing some Flash stuff at that time as well. I, I was really inspired. Um, so when I started, you know, with all of this, uh, I started as a Flash developer, got into HTML front end, and you know, kind of stumbled into product management and product design and product creation. I've realized that you know, wireframes are important, and you know, that's something that's a part of this process. Like Rahul mentioned earlier, that design isn't slapping on you know a few pixels on something. It's it's an it's a process. So what I've realized is design is a process and, and wireframes are a part of that process and wireframes need to look good but that's not what they're meant for. Wireframes aren't meant to look good. That's not the purpose of the wireframes. The, well actually I was going to call my talk confessions of a wireframe hoe but uh, uh, I realized I already had put up a topic on the website. Uh, but so you know looking at all these wireframes I get inspired, I make these wireframes. What I've come to realize is wireframes are meant to explore something. There's a reason behind why we make wireframes. I got very obsessed, and I think a lot of designers do as well. I would you know, buy my pencils, buy my sketchbooks, sit in a coffee shop. That's the, that's the rosy picture that everyone dreams of, right? You're a, you're a designer sitting in a coffee shop all day with a sketchbook, a few nice pencils, and you're drawing, ske sketching wireframes, which are going to change the world or at least get popular on Flickr or Dribbble or Instagram. And I've realized, I think, ho hopefully for the good, that there's a bigger reason behind that. The wireframe is called a wireframe because it is the most basic essence of your product. It's where you explore that why are you building this product? What's the purpose of this product? How can you build this product? And what are the things you should think about? What are the things you should not think about? It's the one place where before you get into development, you're not bound by the constraints of the platform that you're building for. You know, if you're building a website or an iOS app or an Android app, it's the place where none of that matters. What matters is the idea. You have an idea and this is where you're trying to figure out how or why am I building this product and how is this idea going to translate into a product. That's the purpose of the wireframes, right? So, with this knowledge, I, you know, this is something I've raised over the last few years, as you can say, when you know, I've, I've kind of stepped into uh, the shoes of a designer. I started looking at a lot of the processes that go into you know, designing something or creating a product with the same approach. Rather than looking and saying, hey, you know, why, why, do, I, uh, why do I need, or, or how am I going to make this, look at why am I doing or why should I not be doing this you know and that's kind of what I'm gonna I want to talk about a little more in the talk today um, so yeah uh, it's not called confessions of a wireframe ho it's called questioning the why by Navjot Pavera that's me um, and if the people behind at the back can't see me clearly I'll put up another picture of me on online um, that's me, sometimes how I look, uh, as a hippie designer, whatever. And that's some, somehow I look like that. Sometimes as a corrupt politician, if you may, from Punjab. Uh, but I, I want to go back in a little bit, like I mentioned, you know, I was not a trained designer. I became a designer. 
Um, and I, like I said, I started off as an Adobe you know, uh, Flash developer. Um, I wasn't trying to be a Flash developer. I was just trying to do something that was interactive on the screen. I was trying to come up with something that, was, that I, could, I could interact with and it would you know, respond back to me. Or I could make things move uh, when I did something. So over the years, I, I, I mean, Flash was a very short stint, to be honest. Um, from Flash, I very quickly switched to uh, HTML, CSS. Um, because, you know, actually, the, the truth is, when I would make my Flash website uh, or my Flash app, it would be perfect. And I'd put it, put it up on the website, and I didn't know how to put it into the website. So I started doing HTML. I was like, OK, I need to know how to put it in the website. That's how I started. Uh, eventually, uh, got the best job in the world, I think, which Shwetank right now has, which is I was paid to go out, go out and talk at conferences. That's what, that, that was my job. And I was just going out, talking at conferences, uh, putting up funny pictures of me. Uh, on the presentations as well as 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 well as the the websites, and eventually I got into product management. Um, I did that; it was uh, you know web evangelizing. I did that for a while; it was fun, and then I got into product management. Um, and I started as a trial. I was at I was working at Opera at that time, and I got the chance to to take care of a product part time initially. So I started doing that, and I really loved it. And within three months, I you know, told, my, uh, told my boss, that, told my mentor that I wanted to move into this full time. I don't want to be traveling around anymore, going to conferences. I wanted to move full time into actually managing product. Um, so, so he was like, OK, well, you, you know, three months, it's been a good trial. All right, why not? So I got into product management. Um, and I used to question, you know, when, I, um, when I got into product management, I used to question what does a product manager do? And the main reason I used to question that was every time I'd call my dad, and I'd be like, he'd be like, how's it going? I was like, going fine. Uh, I've become a product manager now. What does a product manager do? I was like, OK. I didn't know. I didn't know what to tell him, right? So I was like, OK, I'm a manager, so I should be managing people. But I realized people weren't listening to me. So I was like, OK, I need to manage something else now. Oh, I'm a product manager. Maybe I should be managing the product. The product wasn't listening to me either. It was just going you know, in all the directions. So I actually went back to my mentor, and I had this discussion. I was like, what does a product manager do? You know, I know I'm kind of in charge of this product, but what does a product manager do? And he gave me this analogy. He said, think of a football game. You know, it's a football team, a uh, football game, lots of players on the field, usually two, uh, two teams. Uh, well, most of the time, two teams if it's football. Uh, and there's a referee. So as a product manager, you're a referee. You know? You're not very important on the field. People are doing their stuff. You're not the celebrity on the field. But you're needed there to make the game go on. I was like, OK, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? So I was like, OK, great. Um, had a hard time explaining that to my dad. But I was convinced. I was like, OK, that makes sense. I'm the person who's kind of you know, making sure the game's played the way it should be played. Um, a couple of months down the line, the, you know, every product has its ups and downs. Pro, you know, and we were, a couple of months, we were in the down, you know, where the product wasn't going well. And, and I was sitting and having a beer with my mentor. And I was like, you know, you said we're, we're like the referee. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, it's not. I was like, I'll tell you what a product manager is. You go on a field, right? It's a football field. There's two teams, and you know, those are the celebrities. There's a referee. You're not the referee. You're the football. Yeah. <laughs> You're the, you're the person who's been kicked around by the engineers or the developers or the designers, and you have no control, but you're important because you need it for the game to be played. <laughs> you know, you just, you just kicked around. That's what a product manager is. Um, anyways, you know, over time, um, I had a great time learning how to manage products or people or what. You know, you, you learn how to get products out of the day, out of the door. And I kind of changed my definition over time. And I think I went through a confused state where I was confused, a phase where I was quite confused. I was like, product manager is not really a product manager. I went through quite a few phases. So one of my phases was being disillusioned. Right? I was like, product manager is a CEO. A product manager is a mini CEO. You're, you need to think of your product as the CEO. And actually, there's, there's quite a bit of truth in it, right? Um, 
if you're, you're, you're in charge of something, you need to be in, committed to it you know, with all you have. You need to be committed to that product because if you're, you have to be true to what you're doing because if you're not, there's all these other people who are dependent on you, right? The, it could be a design team, it could be a development team, it could be the sales team, the marketing team. You're the person who everyone comes to and says, hey, what are we doing? What's going on with the product? So I was like, okay, you know, you're like the, the mini CEO in a way. You, you need to be really, really focusing on the product. And over time, I realized that was true. But the other second very important role of a product manager was actually to ask questions. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a very big fan of managing people. You know, I like working in environments where people are just moving. People are committed to the to the project, the, 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 the goal, and they're just moving. You, know, you don't need to manage people. So I was like, as a product manager, you're the person who needs to be asking the right questions. You're the person who should be saying why, why not, how, for who, when, you know, all these things. You're the person who needs to have these answers with you. Um, and that made a lot of sense to me. The other thing I realized <clears throat> when I was thinking as a product manager was, Different products are created, you know, and you, you read online about how, you read stories about how people create products, how when there's a product or a startup that becomes successful, there's all these stories, right? This is how they started. This is what they did. And this is where they ended. Uh, and, and I said, all these products are created, but they're not created the same. You can have five startups who are doing the same thing. Uh, like, for example, in... in uh, in India right now, right, in the startup scene, what I've seen is there's a lot of uh, cab companies, you know, there's a lot of startups around transportation. They're all, in a way, doing the same thing, right? The goal's the same, where you want to have, you know, easy availability of cabs. Uh, but all the products are different, right? The experience is different. You use one, you use the second one, the product, the experiences are different. What I realized was every product has a DNA, you know, it's, it's what makes the product what it is. You know, in some of the products you go and you see, okay, you know, this, this product was started by designers because it looks fantastic. Um, or in some places you'd say, oh, this product was definitely started by technology people because it's got all this great technology. Maybe it doesn't look that great, but it's got all this great technology behind it. And you know, so, uh, different people, different backgrounds. And that's where I realized that what I really wanted to do at the, at the beginning of, you know, of my thought process as a kid was I wanted to create products that, you know, that, that were like, I wanted to create products that had a good experience around them. So I was like, okay, I am maybe not the CEO, you know, or maybe I am, but I'm, I'm more towards the design. I'm maybe more of a product designer. And, you know, I, I, kind, of, I kind of realized that I, even as a product designer, the best place to sit at was actually in a product manager's shoes. Because then there was no one to say no to you, right? There's, there's no one. If I would come up with a design, there, there was no one who could say no to me because I was, I'd come up with the design and look at it, I'd be like, yeah, okay, all right, <laughs> keep moving on. Um, but, but that's what I, what I realized I really, really enjoyed. And, um, and so I moved into product design, and for the last four or five years, four years now almost, I've been, focused, I've been focusing on design. And all this while, you know, I, I, I educated as a computer engineer and I did all these things, but I never was a designer. So I'd heard about wireframes, you know, I'd sketch wireframes, not for any products, I would just, you know, just to make something cool. But I didn't know what was the purpose of, you know, I'd heard about wireframes and prototypes and, you know, interaction design techniques, card sorting and, and all these, in, you know, interviewing people and usability testing. Um, a few of these I'd played around with, but I really didn't know what they were for. I didn't know, you know, I was used to going to having a design team and they would come up with something and they would give it to you and you'd be like, oh, I like it or I don't like it, or you'd have a debate and then you'd convince them they were wrong and they'd go back and <laughs> do something again. So I realized there were a lot of these things that I don't know about and I, I, and I to be honest, I didn't, I didn't ever feel that I need to know everything, you know, I didn't feel that I need to know what's prototyping or usability testing or what's pro paper prototyping or rapid prototyping and all these things or wireframing and this and that. Um, what I, so I was like, I don't know any of this. I don't need to know any of this. What I need to know is what do I need to make my products, right? So I, so I, I looked at the wireframes again um, 
And this wasn't, you know, I sat down one day and I said, okay, what are wireframes for? It was just a process over time. I started questioning, I was like, why am I drawing these wireframes? What's the point of these wireframes? Why am I doing this? And it took a while, but I realized, like I mentioned earlier, there was a purpose behind it, right? There was a, there was a, there was a very specific reason why you spend that time doing that exercise. If you look at a product development life cycle, not in the, not the software development life cycle, but yeah, just a, you come up with an idea, you, you're convinced that this is the idea, this is the idea that, that you want to take forward, then you sit down and try to figure out what can you make out of this idea? How can you turn this idea into a product? And that's where I think something like wireframing and prototyping fits in. You know, you have your idea, you make your wireframes, you explore all the other options, all the options that are around there. You're, like I said, you're not bound by anything. You're saying, okay, um, I'm making, for example, let's say I, I want to make uh, a website for dancers, right? You define who that, web, who that product is for. You know, you're like, okay, this product is for dancers. Okay, so what do dancers need? Uh, they want to, so this is for dancers who want to learn dancing. Okay, great. What do, the, what do you want to put on the website? Uh, my, you know, my, my goal is to have a tons of videos. My, my goal is to teach these dancers and I've realized videos are great because they've got video where it shows how, how they move and it's got audio as well. So okay, I'm going to have uh, video uh, on the website. And then you're like, okay, how is this going to look? So you start sketching things and you're like, okay, that, that kind of looks great. Um, and you're convinced that this is correct. This is, this is what's going to work. The sensible thing to do here is probably show it to a few people who've never seen this product before, who've never heard you talk about this product. Because as soon as you do that, they'll point out a few things that they don't understand, right? So it's kind of an exercise to kind of figure out how this process works, how, how your website's going to work, or how your app's going to work. Um, so you ask these questions on the way. You try to find answers to the questions. You, find, you say, who is this for? Why am I doing this? What's my goal? Then you get to the point where you're like, OK, now I need to develop it. How do I develop it? And you, you, know, you get someone intelligent. Who's, who's an engineer, hopefully, or you know, who knows technologies, video and webs, uh, websites, if you're developing on the web, and they'll you know, help you create the product, and then you, you know, keep moving on. So in all of this process, there, if, I had to vary, if I have to simplify it a lot, like to the lowest level, there's kind of two sets of people involved. right? There's, there's the development team, or there's the developers, who are concerned about their, I mean, for them, the, for develop, as a developer, your biggest goal is to be on top of your skills, right, on top of the technologies. And that's a valid goal. You want to make sure when someone comes to you and says, hey, we want to build this, or when you want to build something, right, you want to build something, you don't have to go searching for how do I do this, how do I do this. You need to be on top of your technologies, your skills, and you, you know, you, 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 you design, or you develop it, and you build your prototypes, and you build your products. And there's also this other set, which I might be biased here, but I think of as designers or the product managers or you know, the other people who are kind of questioning or should be questioning, why are we building this? They're the people who are constantly doing, maybe not as designers, but product managers. You know, you're questioning, why am I building this product? So there's a set of people, that, or there's someone sitting there and constantly questioning, why am I building this? Right? Why? What's the goal of this product? What's the purpose of this product? And then you've got your set of people who are like, how do we do this? How are we going to build this? And, and if you get a good combination of those two, I think you've got a solid team. Um, now, on the same analogy, I read this um, book, uh, um, which I, I, I mentioned in my intro video as well, which is where I actually got the idea for this talk. Uh, I read it uh, last year. Um, I actually really recommend people read it. Uh, it's called Shape of Design. Developers, designers, a very short read, but it's to me, it was like I had, I had, I spent more time thinking about what I was reading than actually reading. You know, it was that kind of a book. It was fantastic. And in that book, um, the author, Frank Chimero, he talks about how and why. You know, he, he really spelled it out. He's like, okay, these are the two things, and this is how, you, how these come together. And he gives an analogy, which I think is really, really good. If you've ever painted, you know, uh, this, this, is, this example is from the book, so you'll find it there as well. The books, <coughs> this painting is called The Art of Painting. Um, and in this image, what you see is a, is a painter sitting there with a subject in front of him, and he's drawing strokes to, to paint this picture. Now, in this scenario, in this scene, what you see is the painter's focus on his canvas. The painter's looking at his canvas and figuring out how he's going to draw, draw every stroke. 
You know, and maybe he's drawing the, the, the dress she's wearing. So he's concerned about, okay, how am I going to make this dress look like, how am I going to make my painting look like the dress? How does every fold, you know, how am I going to draw every stroke so that, so he's concerned about his skill, right? Now, if you've ever painted, this isn't the whole picture. Because if you've ever painted, you'd be sitting like this, going, how am I doing this, how am I doing this? And every now and then, you'll step back. You'll maybe just lift up a bit and say, um, you know, is this kind of fitting in together? I drew this stroke, I drew this stroke. Are they kind of getting together to, to make or create what I, what I wanted to create? Is this, are all these strokes getting together, coming together to make that dress, you know? So these are kind of the two, two stages of creating a painting or anything, right? You're concerned about the house. You need to know how to do it. That's the skill. That's, that's, that's the form. And you also need to be aware of why you're doing this, right? That's the purpose. So there's how and why, form and purpose. And if you, if you think about it now, if you don't have a purpose and you're just building stuff, right? you're just building stuff, where are you headed? Where, what are you doing? You know, you, and I, think I did that a lot when I was a developer, when I was creating products. We just get so engrossed into the technology that we were using and, and, and the, uh, or the new cool uh, you know, s solutions that we found to some, some problems that we just keep on building, keep on building, keep on building. And, and we would forget to ask, why are we doing this? Why, how is this going to come together into a product? Right? Um, so it's very important to keep in mind there's a purpose to every form that you're trying to create. There needs to be. Um, of course, your purpose can be, I'm trying to learn. You know? I, I'm trying to learn this skill, this technology. Keep that in mind. You know? it's, it's, just, it's just, now let me just kind of give you a disclaimer here that I'm not trying to say that this is how you should be approaching everything. All I'm trying to say is, that I kind of realized that this was, a, this was a smart and powerful tool for me to be able to think about the same things in different ways. You know, it's, it's just a tool. It's just when I'm stuck somewhere, I try to think from, come at it from a different angle, different perspective. And this is one of those perspectives, which is why am I doing this? You know, I'm, I'm trying to come up with solutions like design. You know, I, I often say design is a solution, right? It's, that's how I approach design. Yeah? The design can be many things. For me, it's a solution to a problem. And that why is very important for me. Um, so yeah, you know, questioning is, uh, this is, um, you know, it has questions, uh, questions so you can make room for answers. Um, in, uh, there's a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, written by uh, uh, a professor from Harvard. And I read this, not, I didn't read the book, I haven't read the book. I read this on a blog uh, where Jason Fried from 37 Signals is talking about it and he mentions this. He's like, one of the great things that I had, he had a conversation with this professor and he's like, one of the great things the professor said was, questions are, are needed to make space for answers. You need to ask a question so that you can make space for answers. Now if you think about it for a minute, what he's basically trying to say is, if you just keep going on the path that everyone else is going and, and everyone else has been talking about, you're, just gonna, you're, you're not asking any questions and you're not going to come up with anything new, right? You might come up with a remix, which might be new, but there's just another way of thinking about it. If you stop and ask why, or any kind of, you're like, why not, equally important, you, as soon as you do that, you make space for an answer. You make that cavity where you need a solution, right? And that really struck with me. And I was like, yeah, that, that really makes a lot of sense. Um, a few examples here uh, we, we talk about a lot uh, in the design community. Uh, you know, one of the things is when you go to a website or you're using apps, you see all over the interface there's icons. Right? There's different kinds of icons. Um, and Sometimes the icons are just there. There'll be an icon. Uh, I was actually looking at the meta refresh icons. These are, this is a great example. We've got three different icons that can be used to represent refresh. Right? When you've got these icons, if you've seen these icons before, you might know what they mean. Right? If you've not seen them before, you probably won't know what they mean. Right? 
So a lot of times, designers use icons with labels. So they say, this is the icon, and this is the label. This explains what it means. The label explains what it means, but the icon is still needed because it's easier, easier to go back to. You know, once you've used it, you can find it anywhere quickly in the interface and say, OK, this is what I'm going to use, this is what I'm going to use. Uh, I, I want to refresh. So yeah, you know the refresh icon. You can just go and tap it anywhere you want. Um, so, and there's you know there's another school which says, well, why don't we just use labels then, right? Like if, they, if that's and and that's kind of the middle ground there, you know. Um, what I found interesting there was I was doing these in products in, in my projects where I was like, I was I would use icons because they look great. I wanted a minimal interface and I would just have icons, no labels. And you know, the same questioning really helped me there, because I was like, hold on, why do I need icons? Because I was really trying to get a minimal interface, right? So I was like, why do I need icons at all? I was like, well, I need icons because I've got navigation, for instance. You know, I, these, there are actions. There are actions on this interface that people need to be aware of. I was like, OK, but the icons might not communicate those, those actions or, those, or that navigation. So I was like, OK, although I do need this is my design goal. I want a minimal interface, but I want it to be usable, right? I'm, I'm creating a product. I want it to be usable. I want it something. I want to make something that people can use. So I was like, okay, maybe labels can work. Uh, this is just a small, isolated example where, where I really, really went back and said, okay, you know, why am I doing what am I do what I'm doing, and how can I make it better based on what my goal is? Um, so yeah, everything can be questioned. Uh, Another thing is, you know, I mean, the, as soon as I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to be talking about questioning the why, the first thing that came to my mind is, why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> so I went online and I was like, um, I'm going to look for why did the chicken cross the road, right? And uh, because living in India, I've heard this in all the Hollywood movies everywhere. I don't know why the chicken crossed the road. So I went online and I found out, you know, well, the chicken never crossed the road, actually. Uh, there was no chicken ever crossing the road. And if there was, no one knows why he did. Um, so I was like, okay, well, there is a why. I'm going to try and answer it. Uh, and I came up with my own answer. There was a butter chicken shop on the other side, so he was trying to get away from it. Uh, uh, but this just popped up, so I was like, yeah, it's too, it's too funny not to throw it on the screen. Um, but the point was that you can question everything and anything, right? And it might not have an answer. It might have an answer. The, the point here is just use it as a tool. Just use it as a tool to, to approach your problems or approach your solutions even, evaluate your solutions from different angles. Um, when we're talking about tools, um, now, like I said, I was never a designer, so I got into design. And one of the first things I did was I was like, OK, over time I realized you know, Photoshop is where all the design happens. So I need to learn about Photoshop and Illustrator and Fireworks and Balsamic and all these tools. I was like, OK, great. Uh, I need to know about all these things. and then. When I started just, you know, actually making my website, I was like, oh, there are a few other things that people are talking about. People are talking about typography. People are talking about grids. People are talking about responsive websites, HTML5, all these things. And for the longest time, I would go online, read a blog or a website. If you're a web developer or a web designer, you've probably heard of uh, a list apart. Right? Uh, if you're a designer, um, if you're uh, you know, an app designer in the, which has come up recently, you might not dribble, or you know, you've, you, everyone's got their idols, right? Everyone's got uh, people they wanna, they wanna follow, and people they listen to, and people they read. So I would, that's what I would do. Right? I had my RSS uh, feed reader full of these RSS feeds where I would go, and I look for answers, right? I'd be like, or I'd look for explanations. I'd look for knowledge. I'd, I'd be like, okay, typography. What is typography? I'll go on and, and read a web website about it. I'll read a blog about it. Okay, I know what typography is. Okay, I can use this, right? Typography says, okay, use different fonts. Uh, don't use the normal fonts because they'll look your website. Uh, they'll make your website look great. Um, use uh, these. This. I mean, a lot of you know buzzwords start coming out: kerning and line height and and gutters and all these things. So I would, you know, I would just read all this um, and never question it, because these were the people online who I really looked up to. I would, I would read what someone who I've been following for the last you know, two years, I've been following that person's blog, has said about typography or 
or skeuomorphism or anything, and I'd be like, okay, that's or navigation, you know, floating navigation, and this and that, and I'd take that as the holy grail. I'd be like, okay, that person said it. I don't need to spend any more time on it. I can keep moving on. To be honest, to be fair, I don't think there was anything wrong with it. You know, there's someone who's done all this research, and I kind of respect it. So I'm kind of willing to say, me who doesn't know anything about typography, I don't know anything about the history of typography. Someone who really knows about this stuff is saying something. You know, I could have read a book. So I, I'm going to trust that. I'm going to move forward. There's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly fine. The opportunity that I missed there was because I didn't question them, I didn't learn enough. You know, when I would you know, use something in my designs, in my, in my products, and someone else would ask me, why did you do this, right? My question would be because that person said so, or I read it on this blog. A few others like me would say, oh, fair enough, right, yeah, yeah that person said so. But you know, th there's that opportunity miss where you completely skip over the fact that the reason this person said something, there has to be a reason behind someone said something, right? They said, I'm going to use this on my website. I'm going to use um, jQuery on my website because you know, I need animations. I, and I said, OK, anytime I need animations, I'm going to use jQuery. Right? I, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm sure developers, front-end developers, know much more about JavaScript and whatnot, but I'm just giving an example. I mean, like, OK, anytime I need this, I, I, I'm going to use jQuery. And what I would do is, any time I would need JavaScript on my website, the first thing I would do is script and call jQuery. I'd be like, just as I need it, it's there, right? Um, and jQuery is popular, everyone's using it. But I was like, after a while, I was like, why am I doing this? Why do I need jQuery? What am I trying to accomplish? Um, and it just gave me another, uh, another kind of angle into it. I was like, hold on, I don't need jQuery. All I'm trying to do is make something load when the page loads. OK, all I knew is, need is on load or on window load or whatever it's called. I can't remember anymore. But it kind of gave me that insight on where, where I started questioning this. And as soon as I did that, I kind of went into saying, um, now I know why, what I need. But let me go back and question, why did that person go into this? And then I learned about why jQuery is actually important, right? So, so different things. Um, very, very related to this is this quote, uh, creativity is the defeat of habit by originality. Does anyone recognize this? People in Bangalore should recognize this. Have you gone to, been to Forum, the Forum Mall in Koramangla? Anyone? Forum Mall? Yeah? Have you been to the food court? I first moved to Bangalore in 2003. And at that time, Forum Mall was just opening. And I would go to, I was living right down the, the road in front of Forum, and I would go to Forum Mall, the, the mall, and go to the food court to have my lunch and dinner and whatnot. I, I haven't been there today or yesterday. When, so I, I don't know if it's still there, but I'm pretty sure it should still be there. Because when I came back in 2006, it was still there. When I came back in 2010, it was still there. In the food court, they've got, food court, they've got tables. They've got tables where you can sit and eat. And if you look at the smaller tables, which are the, you know, where you can seat four people, they all have these quotes on them in a weird design. You, know, you never look at it. But one of the quotes there is, creativity is the defeat of habit by originality. That's where I got it from. And it's so true. This is exactly what kind of we've been, I've been talking about, right? If you want to come up with new solutions, you have to question why you're doing something, or why, why you should be doing something, or why not. Um, it really resonates you know, with me, uh, with what I said. I've just been told I've got five minutes left, probably three now. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to just mention, so you know, these are some of the things that I actually already touched upon. You know, there's typography. We think of these things. Um, I'll only talk about the, the line height piece here uh, for the designers. It was, it was an example that really stood out, so I thought it's worth mentioning that you know, when I started looking at websites and, and design, and I was like, OK, line height's important. Line height's something that everyone uses. I went online, and I said, OK, what kind of line height? I don't know anything about typography. What kind of line height do I need? And I found somewhere, I think it was Jason Santa Maria, who said, well, usually 1.2 to 1.4 percentage or points or ENs, whatever you're using, is recommended. I was like, great. And I started using that for the longest time. Very recently, I'd read an article um, by another uh, guy, another you know, internet celebrity, uh, Olivier Ristan, um, from the information architect. He was talking about responsive typography uh, on the web. 
And he mentioned this. He's like, you know, if you don't know what line height you should be using, pick up a book. Pick up a book that you find easy to read, right? So I've got this book. I don't know what the line height is, but I've got this book. I'm like, okay, the fonts are great, and I can easily read it. I love reading it. It's never given me any problems. So he's like, put it in front of you. Hold it where you would hold it, and you're looking at it. Now you've got you know, some text in front of you. Now, if you're designing a website, put the computer, you know, put this book down and sit in front of the computer, normally where it would be. Now pick up the book again and put it where you would hold the book. Now use that as a reference to make sure that when you're sitting here and looking at the website, the line height should, the space between the lines should be approximately the same, right? He's like, that's what line height is. It's just a tool to make sure that, you know, reading experience is easy. And I thought that was great. Yeah, I've been given q and I'm just going to finish this point. And I thought that was great. So, and that can be applied to anything. You know, you have a website, you have your iPhone, you hold the iPhone where you hold the iPhone, hold the book where you hold the book, and you're like, okay, I'm going to try to make it similar. So instead of just, you know, following what someone said, I try to question why. I try to question why are we doing anything that we're doing. It gives you interesting answers. Um, and some of the lines, uh, probably I can talk about it later. Um, I actually, to be honestly, thought I'm going to, be done in 20 minutes, but you know you underestimate yourself. Um, there's similar things about grids and layouts. People say layouts are great. You need layouts. You need grids. 960 grid, 1136 grid. Why? Why do you need grids? The reason grids were started in the first place, even before there was any design, you know, thing to it, was just to make sure that you know the type designers and the printers had a standard. They knew that's my grid. That's where I have to set it. Designer didn't have to go on to the developer and say, I make sure it's in this paragraph or it's falling into this grid. That was, it was a tool. Skewmorphism is another thing that I'm going to skip over. <laughs> so in the end, um, all I want to say is just question why you're designing anything. That's the main thing. Why do you need, even need something to be designed? And to be honest, the answer a lot of times is you don't, right? Your purpose is to build a product. Build a product. If you're not confident about something, don't use it because you're going to end up with something suboptimal. If you are, question. Question as much as you can. Um, so that's it, actually. Uh, you know, that's a great another. Uh, there's no foolish questions, only fools who don't question. And uh, although I've run out of QA time, it still applies here. So if you guys have any questions, uh, maybe we can take it. Oh, OK, yeah, I've, I've just been told there's some, uh, there's some time. So yeah, any, any questions? Any, any, any personal anecdotes or any? Yes, there's one in the back. I'm going to put my Twitter, because I'm a Twitter slut now as well. <laughs> there. Uh, hi, my name is Sandil. I'm a content strategist. Sorry, where is this from? Hi, oh, hi. Yeah. hi. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I'll shut up. So uh, when you design a product, uh, how importance do you uh, give to content? Sorry, how many? H how, how much importance do you give to content? How, man, how much do I pay how attention? Yeah, importance. Importance to the content. To content yeah. it, it all depends on what product you're making, but content usually is very important. I mean, let me, let me talk in this way that when the purpose of your product is to serve the content, content becomes important, right? So content is very important, but and that, I've heard a lot of people, everyone try, likes to say that, but in the reality, what I've seen is uh, when we're building products, you get the idea and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Content Getting the content is also a process. So it takes time for the process to, for the content to start flowing in. So usually, I still end up with lower MIPSIM on my mockups because I don't have the content, right? Or I still get you know, animation, you know, GIFs of cats dancing around for the images that I'm going to use. I don't have the content. Uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, it's very, it's very simple. Content is very important. The challenge is always to get the content on time. If you have the content in front of you and then you're designing around it, I'm pretty sure you're going to end up with a completely different kind of product. And it might make even more sense. But the reality is you might not get the content on time. Um, hi. Uh, here. Yeah, hi. Um, actually, when we are talking about the wireframe, um, I'm from a product-based uh, company, actually. Uh, but whenever the enhancements comes or whenever the new requirements comes from the client, uh, what is the stage where we can start this wireframe? Is that you know, during the development, before just before the development, or while even talking to the, you know, clients, we need to create the wireframes and. Um, so wireframes, like I said, you know, for me, wireframes is a tool to figure out what you're building, 
And wireframes usually start on a whiteboard or on a glass window. We are discussing the idea, we just start putting things up there. And like, okay, so this is what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 this is, that's what I have in mind. Because when you're explaining something to someone, you have something in your mind. And you're using words to communicate with someone else, and they'll make their own picture, right? And you might agree that, yeah, we're, we're, that's, what we have it, that's exactly what we want to build, but it, not, might, it might not be the perfect thing or the thing that each of you have in mind. So it's always good to just put it up in front of you. So that's what I say, yeah? You're having your ideas, discussions, just put them up on the, on the chalkboard, on the whiteboard. That's a wireframe. Yeah, that's all you need. You just, you, and then you, you know, start exploring all the different options. You might go into paper, sketching, or whatever tools you can use, you can afford to use, and you just you know, take it from there. So it's, to me, yeah, it definitely belongs to when the idea is born. That's, that's closer to where you should be experimenting with these things. Thanks. Uh, I just have a question. I'm just yeah. abusing my volunteer powers here. Um, so uh, one of the things that I always keep wondering about is, you know, how do you find the balance between data-driven design and you know, going by your gut feelings? Uh, because yeah. there's this whole new craze about A-B testing and all that yeah, stuff, yeah. and you want to use a lot of data from your customers and figure out which shade of blue works, like yeah, Google yeah. did, for instance, yeah, yeah, yeah. and going by your gut, yeah. which is, I think, the d DNA of your design. Yeah. So how do you find the balance between I think it's, it's Again, I don't think there's any good answer there, right? Because it, I, I'm kind of talking from my experience now. What really happens is, you, if you, right now, for the last two years, I worked at a product company. I was leading the product there, product design. Now, just about two months ago, I moved to a product design company where I'm actually, it's a services company where I'm in charge of product design, right? So it, it's different realities. Right now, a client will come and say, hey, we want to do this, and this is the amount of time we have. And if it's really not, you know, if you have the option of saying, no, this is not good, we need more time because, you know, we need to explore all the options, you can say that. But a lot of times you don't have that option, right? So I don't think the, the right approach might be to say what's the correct balance, right? The right approach, I think, is depending on how much time you have and how much, what your options are, that's the kind of product you're going to end up with, you know? And, and all this, again, is, is, is not is not a curriculum, it's not, it's not a discipline, right? It's, it's, a, it's exploration. So you, you, a lot of times you just want to throw all the answers out and say, okay, I'm not going to question anything. I got my first idea, I'm just going to go with it. And then you can see if it goes around or not, right? Um, I'm not sure I answered that question in the best way, but that's the best I could come up with. Yeah, so uh, I quite liked your idea about uh, finding questions in your wireframes and uh, product design on your wireframes. But there is a very uh, colloquial line, uh, paralysis by analysis. Yeah. So uh, I have been, till now, mostly been looking pro at uh, product managers and product designers at work yeah. and trying to figure out now for, for myself what, how this thing works. Yeah. So how do you basically uh, balance between this whole idea of paralysis by analysis yeah. and que keep, keep questioning where you want to take a product to? It's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because um, the thing is, all these you know, usability testing and user experience testing and prototyping and wireframing, all these teach you to explore as many options as you can, right? And, and that's the goal. That's the goal there as well. But it's very easy to get stuck into this and just keep not, you know, you get into this stage fright where you don't want to release anything because you're like, I don't have anything perfect. But one thing that helps there is you're never going to have anything perfect till you've actually put it out there. Because whatever you have in front of you is only true for yourself. You know, you can never be able, it's very rare that you'll be able to figure out the perfect solution just by yourself without putting it out there, right? Like, I mean, there's a, Ben gave a great example, right? He, saw, he thought DocPad was going to end when Google came up with something, right? And if he was just thinking about it in that closed silo, he would have been like, oh, I'm dead. But people were still using it because people suddenly had another use for it, right? Or there was another scenario. So it's very difficult, but it's... I don't think I'm experienced enough to give you an answer. The only thing I can say is experience helps. <laughs> you, you, you release a few products, you, you get out with some stuff, and all, in the end, what I can say is, till I put it out to the customers, nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. It's, don't spend, and that's kind of why you make wireframes as well, because you want to make sure, by the time you get into the development stage, you're not on a path, already on a path that's completely different, because you're going to spend three weeks developing something, and there is, oh, shit. So you do the exploration in the wireframe stage. Uh, here. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, yeah, hey. Uh, hey one question. Varun. Here. Last question, sir, I've been told. All right. Uh, Varun uh, here. Uh, uh, hold I'm on, there's two mics. Sorry. Okay. Which one? Uh, me. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my name is Varun. I'm an engineer and designer, exactly like you. So uh, what happens is I I've worked for a lot of startups, like four or five, as I can remember. And uh, whenever I'm sketching wireframes, they ask me, why are you sketching? How does it help? Yeah. And I've never had a definite answer yeah. to give them. So how do you, you know, convince your employer that sketching yeah. is an integral part of what you're doing? Well, I mean, there's best way is actually to, to be able to show them why, why you're doing it, like to show them the value of it. So you, you know, like when I do wireframes, I'm looking at all the different options. So I'll draw three kinds of sign-up screens, right? So I'll put them in front of them. And I'll be like, which one do we go for? No, but then they they go like, okay, you could have done this, you know, directly. But how do you explain to them that? Okay, they, why didn't you get a, Why exactly, didn't you come to me with the right solution? I, I know exactly. No, they start questioning you that. Okay, why are you sketching? You're wasting time because sometimes you spend like a couple of days, like three yeah, days, yeah, yeah. four days on sketching. Yeah. And they don't quite get the importance of it. So how do you, you know, sit and explain that it helps in your design process? Um, I, I've I've experienced that as well, and I think. Um, uh, over the time, I've kind of become better at it. And, and one of the things, like I said, is just to kind of put it in front of them and say, okay. But the other thing is, I mean, sometimes I've seen, I, I just explain, I was like, you know, the reason I'm doing wireframes is to explore all the options. Because if we don't, we'll go into the design phase and the development phase. For me to change my wireframes takes two minutes. Because it's a sketch, I can say, no, let's go on to the next one. I want to explore all the options, the UX flow, the interaction design, the, you know, the, the, the whole user experience, how this is going to work. If something goes wrong, I, it takes me two minutes to just rub this off and make a new one, right? So it's, gonna, it's not going to take me much time, and that's the point of wireframes. If, if we go into development phase and, and we start doing this, and we realize something like that, oh, this navigation doesn't work here, we're going to have to redo all that work again, right? So it's, it's, it's very cheap. That's the main, uh, that's, it's, very, it's a very cheap way to figure out what your product's going to be. Right, thanks, right? thanks. So it's, it's, yeah. There's value in that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. And if you, there's more discussions, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll catch up over the next two days. Thanks. Uh, we'll have five minutes break before the next talk. Yeah. Yeah, guys, there's tea and coffee outside if you'd like to help yourselves. Yeah. It's in the cafeteria upstairs.